Chapter 2 Investigation of the Four Bodies in Search of I Who is this I? Once upon a time there lived a man named Gomaji Ganesh who lived in a town called Andari. At one point in time this man established a custom in the courts of law that no order or document could be accepted as legal unless it bore a stamp with his name on it, along with the words, the brass door. From that point on, all of the officials of the town only accepted a document as being legal if it bore the stamp of Gomaji Ganesh, the brass door. This procedure for making documents legal continued for a long time until eventually the stamp officially became part of the legal system of the city of Andari. And no one ever inquired as to just whom this Gomaji Ganesh was. As time passed, it happened that one day an important document that did not bear the official stamp of Gomaji Ganesh, the Bias door, was cited as evidence in a case filed in the court of law. Except for the fact that this document did not have the official stamp, it was otherwise completely legal according to all points of law and ordinary procedure. At one point in the case, an objection was raised that the document should not be accepted as evidence because it did not bear the official stamp of Gomaji Ganesh, the brass door. At that point, a courageous man who was party to the lawsuit argued before the judge that the document was perfectly valid because it bore all of the relevant signatures of the current government officials. He argued, why should the document not be admissible if it is otherwise perfectly legal, except that it does not bear the stamp of Mr. Gomaji Ganesh? And thus he questioned the legality of the stamp itself. Consequently, the legality of the stamp was made an issue of contention. Until that day, no one had ventured to bring this issue before a court of law. Since it had now arisen for the first time, it was decided that a decision should be made regarding the legality of this stamp. Out of curiosity about how the procedure of the stamp of the brass door came to be put in place, the judge himself took the matter in hand for inquiry. When his inquiry was completed, he discovered that many years in the past, a man of no particular status, a Mr. Gomaji Ganesh, had taken advantage of the badly administered government of his day and put his own name on a stamp that was to be used for all official documents. And from that time onward, all government officials simply continued following the tradition blindly. In fact, the judge discovered that Mr. Gomaji Ganesh was a man of no importance whatsoever, who had no authority of any kind. When the judge made this discovery, a decision was made by the court that the stamp was no longer necessary for legal documents. Since that day, the stamp was looked upon with ridicule. In the same way, we must inquire about the sense of I and how it dominates everything with the stamp of I and mine. Just like the pseudo stamp of Mr. Gomaji Ganesh. It is a general rule or principle in nature that if two things are combined, some new third thing is produced. For example, by the contact of a piece of thread with flowers, a garland is produced that did not previously exist. Even the names of the parent objects whose contact was responsible for producing the garland disappear as soon as the garland comes into existence. The garland then comes to be known by its own label. The labels of flowers and thread become extinct, and the new name of garland is used, 
And with that new name, further action takes place. With the contact of earth and water, mud arises as the labels earth and water become extinct. In much the same way, stones, bricks, mud, and masonry come together. And a third thing called a wall stands before our eyes, while the stones, bricks, mud, and the mason simply vanish from our sight. It is by the coming together of knowledge and ignorance that a particular thing called the intellect comes into existence. And it is through this intellect that the contact with the world emerges. Gold and goldsmith come together and produce a third thing that appears before our eyes as an ornament. The ornament is seen and the gold and goldsmith are forgotten. As a matter of fact, if anyone was to try to find out if there is any such thing as an ornament inside the gold, one would see nothing but gold. If we tell someone to bring an ornament without touching the gold, what could he bring? The thing we call an ornament would simply vanish. In the same way, out of the union of Brahman as absolute pure consciousness and Maya, illusion, the thief called I has come along proudly saying, I, and raising its head, proclaiming sovereignty over both Brahman and Maya. This I, or ego, is a barren woman's son, Maya's son, who tries to establish unlimited sovereignty over the entire universe. If we observe the parents of this I, it is clear that it is impossible for them to give birth to such a child. The mother of the child is Maya, illusion, which does not exist. From the womb of this Maya, the I has come forth. It is supposed to have been produced by the life energy. Yet this life energy, Brahman, has no gender and does not even claim to possess doership. As described above, the existence of I is only a name. Yet, like Mr. Gomaji Ganesh, this false I announces his name everywhere as I, and goes around saying, I am wise, I am great, I am small all the while having forgotten from which it came. Instead, the false eye starts glorifying itself as I, like the cat who laps up milk with its eyes closed, not aware of the stick that is ready to strike him from the rear. As soon as he accepts a right or a privilege, he must also accept the responsibility that goes along with it. As soon as one says, I am the doer of a certain act, that I must enjoy the fruits of such action. Enjoyment and suffering of the fruits or the results of action are tied to the action itself and to the identification as the doer. Actually, no such thing as an I exists. The entire doership that is the motivating force behind the I is contained solely in Brahman. However, Brahman is so brilliant, the moment that it finds someone who takes pride in doership, all responsibility for the actions on the head of that I remain unattached. Consequently, the poor eye is destined to revolve on the wheel of birth and death. 
In the example of the garland mentioned, the name garland came forward after the names flowers and thread were forgotten. When the garland dries up, nobody says that the flowers have dried up. They say the garland has dried up. Or if the thread snaps, they say the garland has snapped. This indicates that the doership of the original object is imposed upon the third object due to this pride, or identification with the object. In the same way, a series of miseries strike the non-existent eye. If one wants to get free from this misery, he must leave the eye. However, before it is left off, one has to find out exactly where this I resides. It is only when we find the I that we can talk about leaving it off. The aspirant must begin the search for this I at his or her own center. It will never be found outside of us. In every human being, this sense of I, or ego, and mine, the feeling of possession, is filling one up to the brim. All the actions in the world are carried out by the force of this ego and the sense of mine. The assumption of I is taken for granted by all human beings. However, all actions can be carried out without this ego, or the sense of mind. How this can be done shall be seen shortly. Presently, we will discuss only this sense of I and mine. In order to trace this I, let us first examine our own physical gross body that seems so close to us. After analyzing this body, Let us see if this I can be found anywhere in the body.